Have you ever wondered how you can embrace silence in your life? That's what we'll talk about today. In silence and quietness, the devout soul makes progress and learns the hidden mysteries of the scriptures. Thomas A. Kempis Today we're going to continue our conversation on Stilta, the Dutch art of quietude, by Mirjam van der Vitt. Last week we talked about how stillness could improve our quiet relationship with God, let us fill ourselves with what's important, and gain that connection we wish to have with God. This week we're going to take some practical advice about what we can do to actually make that happen. The problem, again, with me in general is that I'm not a very quiet person. I'm not a very still person. Even when I'm just reading a book or watching TV, I tend to be multitasking all the time. When I hear people talk about hearing the voice of God, I think, you know, I don't know that I actually do hear the voice of God. And then reading this book makes me think, is that just because I'm noisy and I'm drowning out any possible message or connection I could get with God? This book was a lot of food for thought about what I could do to be better with that. She writes that the first important thing is that Stillness and quiet silence should become a basic part of our life, something that we do all the time, a toolbox in the things that we have at our disposal in order to create that connection with God, the surrender to God. And when we can do that, we'll always have these tools ready to help us do that. And some of these are lists of the tools that she can give us to help us get there. She says, first of all, you can change scenery. Go somewhere else. If you listen to my other podcast, you know I go hiking. I go out in the woods. When I go camping and when I go hiking, it's the time when I feel closest to God. I'll be honest, I live in a small size city. It's hard for me to hear God, I think, in all this noise and traffic and things around me. And when I go out into the woods or into nature, I hear what I think is God's voice clearly. And it really reduces me to amazement. I get inspirations. Last time I went hiking, I was walking around and watching all the bees and the birds and everything like that. And it struck me that in God's creation, he didn't just invent birds and bees and all the critters and plants that are out there. He invented systems so that everything can continue and grow and adapt and thrive in this world as it changes, as we change, all the things that happen around it. Those are the kinds of things that I get when I go hiking. Suddenly the world becomes clear to me, a little bit like that glass of water that's filled with sand. When I go out in the woods, everything just settles to the bottom, and I can see most things much more clearly. So she suggests that if you can get away, get a change of scenery, it will help. Might be, you know, again, people go to monasteries and other locations to have retreats and quietness and prayer time with God. We have a monastery that's north of my town, and I went hiking there one year. And each kind of way down this hiking path, there's different statuaries to make you ponder and think about the presence of God. Every X many steps you go down, it's a wonderful place to go. I don't go there enough, but that's like a close place. Some people go distance places. Sometimes people travel to large monasteries or places where they can get away for solitude and peace. You'll have to decide for yourself what kind of getaway will make the most impact on you. It helps in order to get concentration so that we can think about the things we're supposed to think about when we're not at home with all of our stuff. And she said that life is a garden and sometimes it's time to prune. We have to crop out some of our activities and the things that we're doing before they start strangling us like vines and weeds in our backyard. And even just getting away from your house can be helpful. When I travel for business, it's really weird. I have so many bad habits, I guess, when I think about being in my house. I'm always working on projects. I always have something I need to do. I'm always doing this or that or going through this room or that room and trying to fix this up or do something. When I go on trips, I suddenly don't have sleeping problems. I don't have a lot of the mental muss I have when I'm at home. 
And I think it's because there's nothing I can do about it in a hotel in a different town. And so it gives me a lot of food for thought. I spent a summer away when I was a junior in college in Israel. And I was a typical college student. I went drinking with my friends on the weekends. We'd go to movies. We'd do all these different things. I went away for the summer and I spent the time in Israel. And boy, I had a lot of food for thought. At the time, I was an atheist in Israel. There were all sorts of things I could talk about that's not on the topic of this podcast. But just being away, not necessarily even in silence, but away from all the things I had in my house or with my friends, I came back. I gave up going to bars with them. I was wasting a lot of money to be in a place I didn't enjoy being in. I was not enjoying the activities I was doing. I was hanging out with the wrong friends. I had a friend who was special to me, and I decided while I was there that my number one priority was strengthening that relationship because she was someone who I really wanted to have a good friendship with, and she still to this day is my best friend. But it took a trip away in Israel for me to even get that kind of clarity about what I should be doing in my life. I changed my major. I changed a lot of things. Eventually, a year later, I became a Christian. So that trip away, being very far away where I couldn't come home if I wanted to, I go camping up north, I can come home anytime I want. You go on a trip to Israel where you're supposed to be there for the entire summer, can't come home, and that forces that last step of getting away from your life and makes you really reconcile with the thoughts that you're having. She says that life is a garden and it's time to prune. All these activities and things we have going on and things we're thinking about and doing, it's not leaving any spot in our lives for the stillness, for that tie to God. And so we have to be the gardener. And I thought that was so insightful because what was Adam's very first task? Be the gardener. Take care of the garden and name everything. And I thought that's so interesting that maybe, in a sense, we were always ordered to be the gardener. We can prune things, cut down on our list. First of all, she suggests that we should make a list of all the things that are important. You know, we have to eat and we have to sleep and we have to be with our families. And then write down how many hours we spend on each of these things. Add it up. She says there's 168 hours in a week. Then make a list of priorities and how many hours a week you spend on them. And she says you can break them down into Big categories like cleaning the house or enjoying TV or playing video games and working or being with your family and see the amount of time you're doing. Now look at that list and see what really doesn't fit with those priorities. You have the list of the things that are important to you. You have the list of the things that you're actually spending your time. Now, where can you make that cut? Because no matter what, quote, kill your darlings, which means even if you just love the thing, that it's important to get rid of them means something like, you know, even in my own life, if there's something I'm doing that is not that productive, not really helping me, not giving me peace, in fact, giving me woe, it's time to go. Not only is it not a priority, but maybe it's even hurting my priorities. And so that's where pruning has to come in. But what she's saying here is even the pruning might be something that we love doing. Then she says we have to get rid of the discontentment because when we start comparing ourselves to other people, when we start judging other people, when we start judging God, and when we start judging our lives, why don't I do this better? Why am I not making more money? Why is my budget so bad? Now we're unhappy and it's destroying our peace. And if we start destroying other people and start destroying ourselves, there's just not going to be anything left. And there's no contentment in that. There's no peace that comes from it. She says that we should make sure that we use all our senses in order to slow down and that we should always celebrate Sundays, meaning that we take time out for rest. I was even joking that a friend of mine works all the time, and I told our pastor, tell him that he should stop working all the time and that he needs to rest. (laughs) But do I do it for myself? No, not really. And so sometimes when we decide we have to rest, it's going to be painful, to be honest. And worry. We need to get rid of worry in our lives because it's also destroying our peace. 
mentioned it before in past podcasts. The number one thing God talks about is fear, which is cause of worry. But that worry is destroying us. God, it tells us, stop worrying. And when we worry, it just runs loose. It's like having a wild dog in your house. It just runs, runs, runs all over the place, and you can't get it to stop. Instead, she suggests picking a time to think about it, maybe a day or two to really focus on it, and see what you can do to actually get that worry to go away, or maybe fix the root cause of what's going on. But when we're worried, we're not going to get anywhere. And if we are prepared to be worried, it's going to take all of our attention and our brain power, and we won't have time for that quiet. We can seek out advice from other people who know us. We can make pros and cons lists. I love that. Every time I make a decision or I have something to think about, I have a pros or cons list. And we can even seek, I think, getting a pastor or someone spiritual in place to help us with these issues, help us try to relieve some of these things that are just destroying our peace. She says, quote, become quiet and ask God to open your eyes to the right decision. And even suggest that if we don't think God is directing us into the right decision, there might be a reason for that. She then discussed fasting, which is mentioned in the Bible. People fasted all the time. And then fasting can help us focus that energy on God. And she says that there's many kinds of fasts out there. You could go against alcohol. I know that people fast against the internet or social media. This one guy, he spends 30 days away from the internet. And then he comes back and he's like, well, what happened while I was gone? Some people take this very seriously. But other times people do something more simple, like they avoid a particular kind of food or spending money or give up TV or, you know, some kind of YouTube thing for a month. And so that will give you more silence and more time to be silent. The idea of fasting is giving up something to learn a spiritual lesson from it. I think it relates even to when people would bring animals to the temple. The idea is to give up something that is dear to you so that you can have that extra place to focus on God. And then she says, with silence. And if we can take that fasting and add it to silence, we'll start feeling that truth of God inside of us so that we can meditate, we can write and journal in order to gain some clarity on this particular topic. And she says, quote, stay in the moment of silence and bring your writing to God's feet. Then when you've gotten it all written down and you've kind of explained all your feelings and your emotions and everything that's going on with you, that's cluttering your life, she says you destroy the writings. You don't want to drag them along. <laughs> a long time ago, my... um aunt was a psychotherapist for children. And I think she thought because I was growing up in a tumultuous upbringing that a diary would help me. And sure enough, so I sat there and I wrote in the diary and every day I put stuff in there. And oh, sure, it was a little therapeutic, I guess. It helped me get some clarity in some of my thoughts that were there. And then I found the diary when I was in college and I was looking through it. And you know what? It was just um, bad. It was depressing, and it was a cloud. I burned it. I burned the whole thing. You might think it would be great to go back and look at it and see what I thought. You know, all it did was dredge up everything my dad did to me, everything that was said, every time he wrecked a birthday. And you know what? I don't want to carry that around. I want to work on forgiveness, not dredging up the past. So when she said to write these things down and then burn it or get rid of it, wow, that really meant something to me. Like, I think even then I had the right idea. But I like this idea of writing things down and destroying it. I had a friend who used to work in a public relations job. And when anyone wrote her a nasty gram, she would always write this letter in response, saying kind of the thing she wanted to say. And then she would destroy the file and then write the nice letter that she was meaning to do it. And I think that you could think, oh, well, that's disingenuous. But instead, what it did is it helped her get kind of the venom out of her system. And then by destroying it and not sending it, then she was able to write the thing that she was supposed to write, the kind thing and the helpful thing. This is a good idea. 
She says that we could also make a collage. We talked about the vision board and other podcasts and start with small steps. We can do other types of crafts if you want to, or take like um, painting or, you know, take some sort of an art class or even look for things outside. You know, every time I go on a big hike, I went to Iceland, I went to Hawaii, I did this hike in the Olympic National Forest, I did a big hike in England. I have a rock in this vase from every major hike I've ever taken. Iceland was a lava rock. You know, in Hawaii, it was also a lava rock. In England, it was a standard granite stone. But they're all memories for me of the places I go. She said that you can also photograph things that bring you peace and remind you of that peace of God. Even things like knitting and crocheting and hobbies with your hand. People talk about knitting being the new yoga because I think it does focus our brains away from the noise of the world and into this quiet, relaxing hobby. All of her suggestions when it comes to these hobbies is the idea is that we're going to produce something simple, that we're going to cleanse our mind of what's been filling it up and hopefully gaining some peace by doing either something artistic or something useful or getting outside. The idea is to regain that focus and get rid of the clutter in our brains. She even talks about having what she calls a monastery cell and putting it in our houses. It means building a room that we have place for quietness. And she said that it doesn't have to be a lot. It's just a place without noise and phones and clocks and charging devices for your phones. Your iPad isn't sitting there looking at you. Anything that would distract you or keep you away from that silence. Then have a really nice candle, and she even says that you can sit on a meditation bench. But do whatever it is that makes sense for your life and your home. It doesn't have to be all done up. Don't make this complicated, but have a place in your house that you can meditate. And I think the most important part is it just doesn't have distractions. This might be hard for me. I have a clock and an echo device almost in every room. So it's making me think a little bit about how I can get a room of contemplation. She says that we should have Lectio Divina, which means divine reading. That means some passages, some parts of scripture, something that you can read that will bring you that close to God. She says that you should fix something that takes about 20 minutes of time. Before you get started, you're going to quiet that room. You're going to have it be the right temperature. You're going to light a candle. You can start with some quiet music to help calm you down. And she said then you can read your text. It could be a psalm. It could be a scripture passage. And then just focus in silence on those words that you've been reading. Then comes time for prayer so that you can pray about the words, the, the reading that you're doing. And then you end the whole thing with a prayer or a blessing or a song or something that you can take away from this event. She says it's important that when we do this, we think about God's light, about him entering our heart, about the word of God and what it means to us, and letting go of our own thoughts and trying to listen to God while we're in that silence. She says that when we light the candle, we could think of this as a sign of connection that we can see it as the light of God, and that we can take that light and make it a sign for what's important to us, whether it's time of year, thinking about plans in life, thinking about other people, but that light will be a guidance to us all. <laughs> Think about those old churches and where people come in and they light a candle first thing off. I think it's a great action, and that focus on that one light seems really important. So I like her suggestion here. She says you can go through the Lord's Prayer or a simple prayer song in your head. There are some written prayers from the early church that comes to us. You know, there's some even in the Bible that are good ones. We think about the prayer of Mary. We think about the prayer of Moses. She gives the example of Psalm 124.8. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. We'll also talk about Psalm 23 
where God is going to have us lie down in still pastures and get that rest we so need. So I think your passage or what you're looking at depends on what it is you're needing at that moment. And she even mentions that it may be useful to head out for a retreat. There's all sorts of retreats out there, not just buildings, but even programmed retreats that are meant for groups of people to help you gain that quiet stillness with God. Maybe investigate one of those. Overall, like I said, I think this book was food for thought. I was prepared to decide I didn't need any of this. But when I read the book and I saw what she was talking about, a noisy person like me probably needs it more than anyone else. It's a good idea. I enjoyed the book. I really want to hear more from her and what her thoughts are. So my challenge to you is try to come up with one place in your house, as it stands now, that you could create a quiet place for you to have that silence, that prayer, that hymn, that reading. Get a candle and try to make it that place to have your own quiet retreat. Once you've identified the place, maybe you had to shuffle a few things around. I know I have some echo devices I need to get rid of. Make that your spot to go listen to the voice of God. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening. I hope this podcast is interesting to you. Like my other podcasts, I try to pick a variety of topics, variety of books to challenge you into some new kind of thinking. Challenges me. I know I think about all sorts of new things like this book while doing the podcast. Please remember to subscribe, tell a friend about the podcast, and remember that you can gain that retreat so that you can meet with God by taking small steps. Small steps.